one way for me to do it is to go to the public website. Okay, this is the public website I have for the deep learning course. All the slides are out here. And as I mentioned earlier on, I just uh, make some modifications uh, when I'm teaching it and, and pull it in. It, I, if it is not up here, uh, I put it on the uh, Piazza, right? On the Piazza, I can I put it there. I think I will. I might have put, put some of these. So what I, because there's so much material here, I can't cover all of this uh, during the semester. So then, then the question comes in is, what are we supposed to do? Uh, I say, okay, I pull this material in. Okay, that's what you're, you're going to be reading. So that, that's why I have two versions of it. One is the more comprehensive version covering all the material. Other one is a shorter version, the material that you are supposed to focus on, right? So anyway, this week I thought I'd just cover these two parts. One is uh, introduction to deep learning, which is actually uh, um, the kind of introduction the Goodfellow book gives about what is deep learning. But then I've had to update it, as I mentioned before. It's not quite quite uh, what people are talking about today. And uh, this was a very nice paper overview of uh, deep learning. It is actually my presentation of a particular paper in a, in a prestigious journal called Nature or Science or something like that written by the three people who won the Turing Award this year. Uh, um, that is uh, uh, Hinton, uh, Lacoon, and Bengio. So they had a paper on uh, an overview of deep learning in, in, in nature or science, a very nice paper. But it was, it was not meant as a, a course introduction. So the whole uh, tone of it is, is somewhat different. It's for uh, somebody in science to, uh, to know about what is deep learning. So, so in a way, these are, these are kind of overlapping, but not exactly the same thing. But I think it's worthwhile to do both. So I've got both of these. And these uh, historical trends and depth in deep learning and so on, this is also from chapter one of the book. And I, I kind of take off on it a little bit. I say, OK, let's, let me add this part on the history that they didn't cover in that part. So <laughs> the slides end up becoming more uh, than, uh, uh, than in, the, in the original book. And so that's uh, that's what uh, we're going to cover. And then, of course, these are all the material as we go along. The slide I, I went over the uh, the syllabus, and this kind of fills in the syllabus. What is what? What are the topics in linear algebra? Probability linear algebra part is also interesting. It's not just the basics, matrix multiplication, and so on. It gets into like principal components analysis. It's a big topic in machine learning. That is only that is regarded as a, as a linear algebra topic here. <laughs> just linear algebra, principal components analysis. So that is also included in linear algebra. And uh, probability and information theory is also worthwhile to, to take a look at because we talk about things like kullback leibler divergence and so on that keeps coming up again and again. So it's worthwhile to, to look at that as well. And all of this about gradient-based optimization goes into numerical computation. Machine learning basics has all of these topics you know, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, uh, and uh, uh, and then here I put a small section in here, which is not from the book at all, is uh, what about uh, software libraries, Python libraries, uh, what is TensorFlow, and uh, how to implement this pro your project one. Here, are this, here is the slide for project one. You, you might be done with your project one. Maybe three weeks is too much for it. Um, maybe two weeks would be enough for it. For doing that, because you just keep being given the code and, and just to try it out, make sure you you know how that works. And here, this is uh, 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 those are the basic. Okay, there are three parts actually. This is called applied math and machine learning basics, and then it becomes uh, practice. This is the second part. Third part is the research part, and it's got all of these modern practices, uh, all these topics of uh, deep feedforward networks, regularization. No? Look at the number of methods of regularization. There are 13 different methods of regularization. All of them quite interesting, worthwhile knowing all of these topics. And then uh, all kinds of optimization methods, op Adam optimizer and so on. So many of these optimizers. Uh, and CNN is a big topic. One of the Turing Awards winners, uh, Yann LeCun, his contribution was this part, convolutional neural networks. That's what he did. And uh, Jeffrey Hinton, of course, uh, uh, did the backdrop, the very basic stuff about optimization. That's where his contributions came in. 
and uh, Bengio on this newer things like Gantt and so on. Um, then there's the whole thing about sequential uh, sequence modeling, RNNs and LSTMs, and uh, um, you know the, the material again is getting outdated here with LSTMs because there's all these NLP processing called Ernie and Bert and so on. There was only Bert, but in the last few months there's Ernie also. So there's, there's just an infinite number of uh, exciting developments. Every one of them is uh, is worth studying. So there is. Um, Somehow we need to kind of try to keep up with these uh, because what happens in each of these things is they kind of completely replace something else that existed earlier on. This is the nature of AI machine learning. The old stuff becomes totally irre irrelevant. We go on to the next. So we have to kind of keep an eye on the rear view mirror while we're doing this. That's coming up here and and uh, we better start looking at it. So this is the challenge of, uh, of uh, deep learning. And then deep learning research is all these topics on uh, which I mentioned already. There is also all of this stuff of uh, probabilistic graphical models make, a, make an appearance here. And uh, the connection between the two, that's another extremely important topic that people are talking about is uh, what, what's the next thing for deep learning is, is to combine it with uh, causal reasoning and so on. It comes from PGM, so there is some indication of that stuff here. And then uh, this is a huge topic which I've expanded. It's not part of the book. Most of it is uh, my own expansion here because four years ago, GANs were not such an important topic, but those have, and so I got all of this material here on, on GANs over here. So this is the full range uh, of, of material for you, to, for you to look at, okay? All right, so let's go to this first one. I hope this link works. Okay, introduction to deep learning and uh, Okay, so now we now begin with uh, with uh, what is uh, artificial intelligence, what is machine learning, what is deep learning. You know, we're starting at that point, uh, and we begin with uh, artificial intelligence paradigm shifts, saying uh, AI has been around. Actually, when I was a student here 50 years ago, I did a project on AI, believe it or not, right here at ISC in the late 60s. We were talking about artificial intelligence. Uh, there was a movie that uh, that was running here in Bangalore. There was a movie theater called Lido, right? Is that still there? <laughs> right. I remember having seen it. It was called 2001 Space Odyssey. That was the movie. It was about, it was in 1967. It's like 40 years from now, AI would have taken over, right? So that, that was about, and what would it be like in 2001, right? It was a prediction for the far into the future, 35 years from, from then. And how this AI system, which had language capability and all kinds of Machiavellian tendencies, how it would take over the control of the spaceship from the humans who were, who were running that spaceship. That's what that was. That was an interesting one. Marvin Minsky was one of the uh, advisors for, the, uh, for that movie. And so AI was around 50 years ago. And, uh, but the methods of AI since Marvin Minsky have dramatically shifted. We call this as paradigm shifts. So there was this knowledge-based approach to AI, and which was all about human beings thinking about how to create AI, how, to, how do we write the logic behind uh, making a, a program function in an intelligent way. That was the original paradigm, Minsky, and most of the top uh, AI uh, labs in the world, the, the uh, Minsky's, uh, uh, Minsky was at MIT, the MIT AI lab, was very much into this about uh, you know encoding knowledge uh, to perform AI, uh, and uh, and then uh, for that was the one paradigm. The next paradigm was uh, well, you're not going to have if then else type of rules. Uh, we should do that part instead of doing if then and else rules. We should be doing it uh, with machine learning now, saying uh, it has to learn. Here are all the uh, raw attributes that are coming in then rather than write rules like saying if this value is this, if that value is that, and then it's got to be this class or this value, we would uh, simply find a mapping from these features using an automated technique called machine learning technique. Simple machine learning was a paradigm shift from knowledge base to simple machine learning. And then of course today with deep learning, what we are saying is even the machine learning approach was not good enough because uh, who gives you all those uh, all those features that are input to the machine learning program, 
and that is done by uh, uh, engineers, knowledge engineers, and that takes a, a lot of effort to figure out what kind of features go into this program. So that is so time consuming to uh, engineer those features. So it was not practical. Deep learning goes about figuring out what those what those features ought to be. So the, so what is deep learning then is it is uh, it is techniques for uh, for learning representations. So we go from uh, raw data, it, it learns what the representations are in the final method of classification or doing regression. Okay, that is done by straightforward techniques. But the key part of the deep learning is to come up with representations. In, in the architecture of deep learning, we talk about layers and layers and layers, and we say that is depth. And then we say, well, what is happening in these layers is we are, we are learning progressively better representations. So that is the key part here. So, so here, yeah, this is first we come up with the definition of deep learning. People are still defining what is deep learning. One good definition is deep learning is inspired by uh, the function of the brain, biological brain, let's say human. So we are inspired by the brain, but not necessarily exactly model it. We're inspired by the brain uh, to develop uh, systems, architectures, what have you, to uh, learn representations. Learned. So we go from inspired by the brain, we're talking about neural networks, these kinds of things, to learn representations. And of course, to perform artificial intelligence type of tasks, to perform intelligent tasks. So in a way, deep learning can be thought of as an aspiration. It's not like a well-defined thing. He's saying it is just we are inspired by the brain uh, to, uh, to learn representations of the of raw data to perform tasks of, of, uh, that, are, that we are interested in. So it's an aspiration rather than a finished thing. Maybe in some other areas, maybe every area is an aspiration. Artificial intelligence is an aspiration. What is AI? So AI is, is to get computers to do things which when done by a human being, we would say that is intelligence, right? Some kind of a, a amorphous definition of what is AI. But again, it's an aspiration. We would like the machine to, to do AI. And just like that, deep learning is an aspiration. And maybe a few other things. Machine learning is an aspiration. But perhaps uh, databases is not an aspiration. It's like a, like a very concrete thing. And I don't know, uh, cyber security. Maybe it's very concrete, May, or maybe it's an aspiration. It's never finished. Uh, so there are many areas of computer science that are kind of, you know, finished products as opposed to a broad nebulous thing that is that is evolving. So that is the nature of this. And uh, oh, this part I need to add those slides. This is uh, comes from another talk I, I like to give, which is software 1.0, software 2.0 which is, uh, this is terminology developed by the AI chief engineer at Tesla. Um, and uh, uh, his name is uh, Andre Karpati. Karpati, he's at Tesla. Uh, he, he, he was put in charge, I suppose, by Elon Musk uh, to handle all the software that goes into their, uh, their, their cars, right? Their autonomous cars. And, uh, and he noticed that uh, in his lab, there are two types of code. One type of code was uh, written by human beings. Uh, they would say, well, you know, with these conditions, this is what you gotta do. This is, this is traditional coding. And he refers to it as software 1.0. This is the traditional code written by human beings, uh, and which requires a lot of effort to maintain, you know, in terms of it's a spaghetti code, right? Things are all twisted around each other. So there's that type of code. It's hard to maintain, debug, and all that. That is software 1.0. Software 2.0 is all the code generated by machine learning programs. So in the sense, the machine learning programs are just given examples and it generates uh, the weights that are needed to perform the task. So in a sense, it's just a straightforward machine learning algorithm trained on lots and lots of data. So it exactly performs what you want to do. But what about uh, maintaining that code? That code is a whole bunch of numbers. It is all the weights for all the uh, all the connections, the network. So it is not possible to 
debug this stuff. This is all numbers here. And you can only retrain it, so on. Uh, so the debugging is 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 a is an issue there. But uh, the software 2.0, nice thing about it is pretty straightforward, layer by layer. It's all matrix. It's all matrix multiplication. So multiply. That's why we got so much of linear algebra coming into it. Is we are multiplying by matrices, and that can all be easily converted uh, into silicon, into hardware. Very simple operations that can all be done. Whereas uh, this software 1.0, the spaghetti code and all that to parallelize it and all, you know, is is a hard thing to do. They're all sequential uh, in nature. So he started referring to it as software 1.0, software 2.0, and then people started pitching in. Uh, I forget where it was, IBM or Microsoft. The program manager they says, "Yeah, I agree. I looked at all the projects that I lead. He is he's the chief uh, chief architect of one of these big companies, and he said I'm looking at all of these, and I agree that almost all the projects we have could all be made into machine learning projects. We can eliminate all the human programming that is needed." And so people have been jumping on that bandwagon, but anyway, it's not that clear cut. Maybe uh, half of it is is conventional programming, half of it is uh, machine learning programming. And uh, I heard Jeffrey Hinton talk the other day about uh, hiring in the computer science department. Oh, they're still hiring, you know, people uh, who would uh, be on the programming end of things, right? They would be on the software development end of things. So he's saying the future is not programming. The future is showing. So uh, it is not the so people sitting and writing code. It's people showing the machine learning program what it's supposed to do, saying if this is the input, this is what it should do. And give enough examples, it should learn. So he's saying we should become all uh, uh, all showers rather than programmers. Right. <laughs> anyway, it's a little bit of extreme hype here. But uh, there is an element of truth. And he, after all, won the won the Turing Award, which is the Nobel Prize for Computer Science, right? Okay. All right. How are we doing on time? We have another half an hour? Wow. That's a lot of time left. Yeah, this is why from next week onwards, the TAs are going to take over at this point, uh, the last half an hour. Today, I'll just fill in on this stuff. You can read all of these slides again. So uh, I don't think this slide is already looking looking ancient because uh, everybody says AI is around. You're, you're, you're using every day. Uh, uh, every search you're making, there is AI coming into play. Every time you even uh, uh, write something as an email, it's already telling you what you should be writing, right? It's already figuring out. And it is not only the syntax, it's all it's very good in the concepts also that this is what you should be doing. AI is at work when you're trying, trying to write email or, or searching, of course, uh, or talking to Alexa or Siri. Because this is a little bit more newfangled. Uh, stuff which is not that much around autonomous vehicles. There's a lot of a lot of talk about it that the automatic driving driving machines. Uh, and uh, uh, this this was taken from some example which is illustrates that it's uh, it sees the barrier here on the highway and it turns around and uh, it can be easily fooled. And if you change the pixels just a little bit, it goes and runs right into the barrier. <laughs> right. Uh, anyway, that uh, that was that example. So anyway, that's uh, so. There's a whole uh, bunch of these things. AI is uh, AI, and the AI is, is all based on machine learning. This AI for all of these tasks is based on machine learning. That that uh, program for Alexa or Siri is not like humans wrote the code saying, you know, what does that word mean? So on. It's all just done by examples, by showing web searches, content filtering on social networks. Right? What what we are presented on Facebook. Uh, recommendations on e-commerce websites, consumer products, cameras, smartphones, ML, machine learning used to identify objects and images, speech to text, match news items, so on. Increasingly, these use not just machine learning, they use deep learning. So deep learning is, is what is driving all of this stuff. And so here we say that uh, it's all about AI. And we're taking a little bit of historical view. Early success of AI solved problems intellectually difficult for humans, uh, problems dis described by a small set of rules, and like chess, sterile formal formal environment. So this was what this is the kind of thing that they did. Little, little knowledge about the world, but they knew all about the domain. And the true challenge of AI is to solve tasks easy to easy for people, but hard to describe formally. It's not those uh, chess can be described very easily. What are the rules of the game? 
or even go i suppose for that matter but um, the true challenge of ai solved intuitively that feel automatic spoken words faces and so on today's ai is about solving these more intuitive problems and actually what's happening here is the early problems they could be solved by the conventional logic based methods software 1.0 and the later ones are requiring that it is uh, they don't scale up so if you have very high resolution images or or uh, lots of examples and so on so they don't scale up so everyday life that's what we are after ai is to solve everyday life problems a person's everyday life requires immense amount of knowledge of the world and all this knowledge is intuitive subjective difficult to articulate and uh, they they need to capture the same knowledge and the key challenge for you how to get this informal knowledge into computer that's what uh, minsky and others were saying earlier on saying knowledge is the is the key let us code all the knowledge let's take on a project but everybody keeps writing writing code about what is now you know what is the knowledge for every domain It doesn't scale up there so many variations so solution to these intuitive problems is to allow computers to learn from experience rather than code that and uh, the other point which comes from the deep learning area is to understand the world as a hierarchy of concepts thereby learn complicated concepts out of simpler ones all right so th that's where the deep learning comes into play so in a way it's like brain like to understand complicated concepts by building them out of simpler ones an interview with jeffrey hinton again is uh, somebody asked him you know i mean he is the preeminent preeminent guy who contributed to deep learning so how and why did you get into this field right and he said well when i was in college he was in england in college i think he was at cambridge as an undergrad or maybe even i think he was in high school he was talking about in high school when i was in high school i was interested how the brain works and there was a, another student in my class he was much smarter than me much smarter than jeffrey hinton and uh, he he was also uh, interested in these topics and he said you know the brain is a hologram he came and told jeffrey hinton brain is a things you know in our brain we hold it as holograms what you know hologram what it is is uh, they have found that if you chop off a part of the brain uh, it still has a picture of the whole thing right and you chop off another part it has a picture of the whole thing maybe less resolution or whatever so so what is happening in the brain is not like this part of the brain holds something that part of the brain holds something else and so on uh, this information is all over the brain so when you take out a little piece of it here and there it doesn't it doesn't affect it that much so it seemed like a plausible explanation that it's like a hologram or, or the basic idea was distributed that the uh, information was not like uh, you know organized in a, as a database like different parts will have different things if the same information is all over the place together they put together what is the information needed so it has got to be distributed so he said i was i was uh, i was fascinated by what this he said that student was much smarter than me he was the one who was saying this and i said yeah that makes sense that that it's distributed and uh, i said i'd like to find out about it and then he went to college at cambridge and he asked a professor uh, how does the brain work he said well the brain consists of neurons they're all connected to each other and 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 they fire uh, and then uh, and then these firings go on and uh, and so that's how the brain works and jeffrey was not satisfied with that with an answer he said that's it yeah that's it that's all we know it's a whole bunch of neurons connected to each other and and together so he said i need a better explanation of, of that so he said the best way to explain to myself is actually a constructed to construct a, uh, a model of it so that's when he went about saying okay i'm going to use a computer to model this idea that the brain consists of a bunch of neurons connected to each other and they all have weights associated with it when they fire and so on and uh, and says that's the model he constructed and then he said how how is it going to learn that came about and that's how we kind of invented the back propagation algorithm which is uh, uh you start with arbitrary arbitrary set of weights and then you have, have present uh, an input and has an output and if the output doesn't match the correct uh, input uh, the correct output it would uh, back propagate the errors and uh, change the values so he invented the back propagation algorithm as a consequence 
of his model. Of course, uh, people have said that he was not the only first one who to invented back propagation. Simultaneously, there was Paul Verbose who had done it as part of a PhD. Nobody knew about it. It was, it was part of his dissertation somewhere else. Uh, and so a couple of others also had thought of it, but he's the one who, who really was focusing on neural networks and came up with this. Um, so anyway, that's, uh, yeah, sometimes I go off on this slight topic and, uh, and so we lose track of where we are. Okay, so this is an example of, uh, of this model. Knowledge-based approach was the old one. The ML approach was the next one, logistic regression, naive base, et cetera. And, uh, uh, and the limitations of conventional machine learning are limited ability to process natural data in raw form. When you took the introductory course on machine learning, many of you have done that, you always start with a feature vector as input, and that is being classified. The question here is, who gives you the feature input, feature vector, right? That's the part that is missing. Uh, that would require a lot of clever engineering to come up with those features. You would, we might have to do all kinds of pre-processing algorithms to construct. That would be human engineered and it is not practical. It doesn't scale up to new problems. And simple machine learning de depends on the representation. And there are some a few things here. Dependence on representation is a well-known concept. If I ask you to multiply two Roman numerals and I say, what is the product of XXVI and uh, XVI? <laughs> I ask you this question. Uh, can you do the multiplication? of these Roman numbers. So you would say, well, what does XSVI? We convert that into another representation. So oh, in decimal in, uh, notation or the Arabic uh, notation, Arabic numerals, right? We call it, call it the Arabic numerals, or maybe it should be Hindu numerals, whatever. So we uh, we convert that into, into that. And then we say in that notation, we can multiply. But if I give you the numbers in, in Roman numerals, it's kind of, you know, extremely hard to do that. So you change it into another representation, it becomes easy. So this is this kind of saying representation is key, and that's what deep learning is all about. It is learning representation. Typically, they start with this complicated data, raw data. It is learning representations, finding a suitable representation. The last task of going from the final representation to the classification is usually done in a very, very simple way. A simple, a simple uh, linear uh, classifier will do for the last part. So it brings it down. When you bring it to a, a desired representation, the task becomes almost trivial. And uh, there are some examples here of going from uh, Arabic, uh, numeral to Arabic for doing tasks, or this data set with Cartesian coordinate, x, y data looks like this. But if you change all the data points to polar coordinates, instead of x, y values, you have, uh, I suppose, r theta, right? Polar coordinates. In r theta space, this. Look at this, the data is nicely separated out. So here you could, you only could do it with a circle to separate out, it's a quadratic classifier. Whereas here a linear classifier will do. So the representation was key. This is what deep learning is about, finds a representation uh, that is suitable for the task. And so that is what, so this is designing the right set of features and deep learning is representation learning, all right? And uh, what are some advantages of multiple levels and uh, we, we go to slightly more and more abstract uh, abstract levels and complex functions can be learned. So we can put uh, all the approaches, so the paradigms of AI. We can say this is the old AI, which is a rule-based input hand-designed program. It's called expert system. Somebody's writing the rule saying if then else, if then else, if then else, like that. And then it provides the output. Okay. It works quite nicely for uh, some simple medical tasks and things like that. That's what the old expert systems were based upon, but they don't scale up to much, much more complicated data. Instead of instead of somebody uh, saying what the features are, if they say, look, uh, I just have these images, what can you do with it? Classic machine learning, again, input hand-designed features. Somebody is writing the code to extract the features from the input. From the image, it is saying, who, you know, what does that image contain? And then the mapping is the machine learning part. So use an SVM, you can say, right? Use an SVM to classify or a random forest to classify or what have you. That's classic machine learning. So representation learning is to go from input. This is the automatically computed features and mapping from features to the output. So you can say this is representation learning. 
Deep learning would be input simple features, additional layers, and more abstract features. And then finally, mapping from the features. So deep learning involves multiple layers. And there is an interesting question is, how many layers? All right, so that will differ that question, how many layers? Oh, these are uh, pictures taken from my phone. I was visiting uh, a year or two ago. This is uh, Cambridge in England, right? Cambridge in England. And, uh, and this is the building that, that Isaac Newton's office was located. <laughs> There's an apple tree in front there. <laughs> this, is, this is an apple tree here. But they said the original apple tree is long gone. And uh, so they brought a cutting or something like that from where it could have been and they planted it again. So there is actually an apple tree there. And that is uh, Newton's office. And of course, in physics, there has been a paradigm shift. Uh, yeah, I took a picture of that building. That's the beautiful thing about uh, Cambridge. I suppose IAC is maybe like that too. You go from one building to the next. All kinds of famous things have happened there. Uh, Cambridge, uh, Newton was here. And uh, uh, Dirac, all right, uh, was in that other building. There are all these colleges, right? So, uh, so they said, well, it moved from physics, moved from Newtonian physics, right? F equal to MA and these kinds of things, went on to quantum mechanics, right? To explain things with, uh, with a much more fine grained way. And, they, and if, if, why did they have to do that? Because Newtonian physics cannot explain black body radiation. All kinds of things are, cannot be done with it. So they needed something more. Quantum mechanics can explain it. Right, so uh, I just said, well, it, it went from this building to that building. That's where, that's where the uh, the quantum mechanics was was invented by all kinds of famous Nobel laureates and so on. Right, just like that in AI has a paradigm shift, just like in physics, knowledge based systems, simple machine learning methods, and then deep learning methods. And another key part of both physics and uh, AI is coexisting paradigms. It's not like Newtonian physics is all completely thrown away, right? When they're designing uh, launch vehicles for, for what, uh, for ISRO or whatever, right? I mean, F equal to MA and uh, these kinds of rules are still useful for them to, uh, so they use those methods at some level and then quantum mechanics is also used. So they coexist. So I think if we can say a similar thing about AI, are all the rule-based systems completely gone? Uh, just as uh, Karpathy said about Tesla, there's, these codes coexist, and I think they'll continue to coexist. So we don't want to throw out all the programmers right away, right? Yeah, here is, uh, if you want, a, again, a more precise uh, definition of deep learning. Deep learning is inspired by neural networks of the brain machines which discover rich and useful internal representation, representation is key, and computed as a composition of learned features and functions, all right? So, so this is a composition. We learn features and the functions as well, all right? So this definition is a goal and does not say much about how we achieve that. That part is something we are still working on. All this deep learning research is about that. And one way to looking at it is, what, have we, what is the research we're doing? By adding priors to learn better high-level representation. All of the topic of regularization, you can say that is all about priors. We put in a prior, right? If you're familiar with uh, basic machine learning for, let's say, linear regression or linear classification, we say we minimize the sum of squared errors, we say, like in regression, regression problem. But we just don't say, well, that's straightforward. Uh, the output should have been thus. It is missing, and it is different from what the uh, system is outputting. So we need to change the weights, compute sum of squared errors, minimize that. We don't just leave it at that, and we say we have to regularize it. And we say we have an additional term which says keep the norm of the uh, weight uh, weights uh, as small as possible. We minimize not only the uh, loss, fu the loss function consists of not only the sum of squared errors, but also a regularization term. That's called norm penalty, norm penalty. But that's only one of those 13 methods we saw there. So many other methods. And, uh, and you can say everyone is a prior. Oh, who says that the, that the weight vector should be as small as possible? That's a prior seems to make sense that uh, when you keep that smaller, uh, you're not overfitting the data, 
right? So that that's the kind of arguments that I made. So this is uh, about adding priors to learn better high level representation. The term deep learning is indeed aspirational, like AI or machine learning. Right. So if you want a one slide definition, of what is deep learning? We are motivated by the brain to learn representations so that uh, we can compute very complicated functions uh, such as recognizing people so on uh, with fine variations so there's some of the examples you see can the uh, program discriminate between a particular dog and a wolf the particular dog looks like a wolf actually it's like a white dog samoyard or something like that it's a dog it looks like a wolf but the program should be able to tell the difference it's a very fine grained difference between the two and uh, these methods of uh, deep learning are able to do that scale to that so the characteristic of deep learning is uh, it improves with the experience in data just like any machine in learning only a viable approach to building ai systems in real world environments and its power is uh, derived from a nested hierarchy of concepts and uh, each concept defined by a relationship to simpler concepts Right. What is this concept thing? The example is the image example. First layer is presence or absence of edges. We're looking at fine things and where are the edges between regions? And the second layer is uh, detect motives by spotting arrangements of edges regardless of small variation of edge positions. So we're saying some, some motives are there, some patterns are there. Third level is assemble motives into larger combinations that correspond to parts of familiar familiar object let's say we're doing face recognition that is the level we go and say hey that's that's a nose here or there's an eye here that's a ear here those are all parts subsequent layers detect objects as combinations of these parts finally we, so this is the kind of thinking which is again inspired by biological things you look at uh, the eye of a frog and all it's doing edge detection and then how does it recognize it's a fly or not and so on so this is the same thing biological inspiration and by doing these layer, 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 we are com computing very, com uh, very uh, complicated functions uh, of these input variables, right? And the key aspect, the key aspect of deep learning is layers are not designed by human engineers. All right, learn from data using a general purpose learning procedure. So anyway, these are useful and specifically applied to these things. Uh, like is this a person or a car or is it an animal and so we go from a visible layer to hidden layer to hidden layer to hidden layer here we go from pixels to edges to corners and contours and object parts and object identity to say whether it's a right that's a picture of me taken about 10 years ago in beijing china one of my students uh, who did his master's degree with me at buffalo he said, okay, I'm going to go start a company. So he started a company, and that company is called Baidu. It's, it's the Google of China, right? And so he's, he lives in China. He, he's a, you know, he became a billionaire. And this glass here behind me is, uh, is the glass of his building. It's a very fancy building in Beijing. So. All right, so there is also unsupervised learning, natural language processing. Again, uh, natural language processing deserves an entire, I think you have a course like that here, I think, right? NLP is taught here. So today NLP has all become deep learning, right? It's all about uh, learning what are called embeddings, called word embeddings uh, from words to uh, VEC and so on. So again, uh, coming to the end of um, the Goodfellow Benjio book, they give one of these nice diagrams about uh, uh, a Venn diagram here. Deep learning is a type of representation learning. And they go with AI here, example, knowledge basis. And then there is the machine learning, logistic regression. Because all of this is AI, but it's a particular machine learning method. Example is logistic regression or SVM, things like that. That's all conventional machine learning. Representation learning is uh, shallow autoencoders. That's learning some features. And then deep learning is uh, multi-layer perceptrons are also there. So it's some kind of a Venn diagram showing where all these things fit in uh, they're all approaches to artificial intelligence and this is again i think it's given in the book i'm forgetting now saying how do you study all of this 
how do you study deep learning? And there are all kinds of flow charts like this. You can go in one direction, another direction, and so on. The things like unsupervised learning here and you know, fully connected networks and so on. So anyway, all kinds of flow charts. The book gives uh, some flow charts. Uh, okay, I think this is from this is from the book. There are 21 chapters. So it says, well, you could study uh, linear algebra, probability theory, and neural computation, machine learning basics. That's one topic, part one. Part two, uh, deep uh, deep uh, functional networks, you know, the regularization, optimization, conventional, uh, convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks, practical methodology application. So this is one part. The other one is the linear factor models, autoencoders, representation learning, and then structured probabilistic models, inference. This is where deep generate. So this is where the, a lot of the action today is in partition. Okay, so this is kind of a flow chart he gives saying that three parts to learning deep learning and uh, you could kind of play around with it but i guess there's no real reason why you should study regularization before optimization and i guess it makes some sense to go in a sequential way right okay so oh, that's what this set of slides is okay let me uh, let me stop there and uh, and let me take any other, other thoughts, questions you have. I'll still have the overview will continue next time also on Wednesday. That's the second part comes from the nature review of what is deep learning. I may need to update that. That's already two, three years old. And a newer one might be emphasizing some other things. Okay. Do you have any other uh, questions at this point for me? Oh, okay, good question. Now, how will the quizzes be? You know, typically what I do, uh, what I have done with my TAs in the US is uh, I get together with the TAs the day before the quiz. And I throw the burden of making up the quiz questions to my teaching assistant saying, okay, you know the material, uh, please uh, make up some reasonable questions. So, so they have to come prepared for that. So the, like on Tuesday, they would, we would meet and say, okay, the three TAs would write uh, quiz questions and uh, four of us would sit and discuss saying okay is this a reasonable question or is that too hard or uh, is it pertinent to this topic so we kind of uh, go through a process of uh, elimination saying make sure that it's a fair question uh, and what kind of question is it I've been kind of doing uh, uh, multiple choice but you can make hard questions with multiple choice right even you, you know you know that can be done with GRE and all that you can have hard questions uh, because you might have to compute something by hand to figure out the answer. So typically, you know, grading is easier if it is multiple choice rather than derive something or so on. So it's that kind of grading easy multiple choice type of questions. Uh, we'll make up on Tuesday with the with the TAs proposing questions and me me asking dumb questions, saying I don't understand this. Please explain what is this question. And so we we do that, right? Yeah. Hmm? No quiz this week. We'll have a quiz next week on Wednesday. If here is, I'm just doing general stuff. So from next week, we'll have quizzes. Yeah. Was there a question in the back there? Yeah. Ah, the number of layers are. Yeah. Yeah. How deep should it be, right? Yeah. So, you know, that's a question is. Uh, Question of the introduction is uh, uh, depth, right? Depth is how many layers are there, right? That's, that's what deep learning. <laughs> what is depth is how many layers, right? So we're saying having multiple layers is a good thing. Uh, you can, uh, uh, actually one layer is enough mathematically speaking, right? Universal approximation theorem says, with one layer you compute any function you want. For all, you're just computing a function. But then why do we need uh, two layers? So why do we, if everything can be done with one, what happens is the number of units on that one layer may be infinite because you have so many, it's a, such a complicated function. So when you go to two layers, three layers, uh, it's more manageable. You can compute, you know, very complicated functions having uh, multiple layers. So if you have 15 layers, 20 layers, 30 layers, you can, uh, you can have a, a more, uh, easily computed function exactly is it three or is it 
one or two or so on those are all fine grained things there isn't exactly a right number of layers okay that's one of the uh, things that comes out just like in programming languages looking at the analogy there is a program which is uh, very long better than a program that is very short there's no exact answer to that in some programming languages you might be able to write something very very in a very small way in other programming languages you need many more many more uh, many more lines of code to write it just like that uh, the uh, exact number is not important but additional layers uh, make it more tractable uh, to solve the problem so there isn't an exact exact answer and, and this field again is full of research questions more questions than answers so there is one of those which requires a formal answer saying all right for this problem can you tell me how many layers i need so is that possible so that's one of those kinds of questions they can it's only answered by saying there is no right number but having more helps right they've shown all kinds of graphs increase the number of layers and layers oh okay the performance is getting better and better but then when you increase it to be a whole lot you have a whole number of free parameters which means you are you are uh, you are uh, learning uh, rote learning all the all what you should learn There's so many free parameters you're not doing any real learning so they, that brings in a question of in machine learning it is important to generalize generalization is the important concept you don't want to memorize everything that's called overfitting so you don't want overfitting and uh, so you have to have the right that, that's a basic question of machine learning okay is uh, how many parameters should there be okay too many parameters you're overfitting too few right so that same issue comes up okay any other questions all right so it's an overview of uh, deep learning again on wednesday and i'll communicate uh, with you all by posting i suppose how shall we communicate we can post it in uh, in piazza right that's how we'll do all right we may be yeah if, if you are not planning to come to class after this please let us know because that that gives us a lot more flexibility if many of you are not coming then uh, we can accommodate the rest of you but if everybody stays then we, we cannot so you know some of you have conflicts some of you can take it next year when it's taught again or whatever right so do do let us know and we'll formulate how we're going to handle a large class okay the, the ts will have a role to play okay okay thank you see you on wednesday <laughs>